way to go. Uh, I had to get training yesterday on how to put my microphone on. I have, I have trouble with basic technology. And, uh, and it usually, if there is a score being kept, it's, uh, the score usually reads technology one, llama zero. So it's gonna fall off, I think, but I'm gonna, can I thread it through the loop? Yeah, okay, then I'll do it. Okay. All right, that should do it. I have the smallest ears in the world, and so making anything for an ear is like, uh, is like not, not really, it doesn't really work like it should. Is it, is it on correct? Okay, good. Because it was not on correctly for oh, quite a while, and he had to let me know. So I want to thank all of you for uh, coming to be with us today. And I hope that uh, you have uh, enjoyed your visit to Columbus KTC, and we hope you will come again and again and bring your goodness to this room. I, I really love this room. I just have to say that from the, from the time that it was first framed uh, by the carpenters and the steel workers who put the, seat, who put the roof on it and then built the floor and the walls and the pillars and the beams. Uh, it's felt like a really good place to be. It feels uh, solid and, uh, and uh, quiet and good. And, and when people bring their sincerity to this place and they bring themselves to this place and they sit in this space, they continuously improve it by meditating here. That's really, I think that's something that maybe folks don't recognize, but the fact that this room gets used over and over and over again for meditation every single week is amazing and good. And, uh, and it allows us to, um, to see the change that happens over time in a place like this. The more this room is used for meditation and, and prayer and chanting, and the more it's used to invite people to come and meet their Buddha nature here in this space, and when people come in and they meet their Buddha nature here in this space, it gives the space more weight and more depth, and it's no longer just a, an empty room somewhere. There's something, uh, something in this room, and that is the the peace that we bring to it. And, um, and so anyway, I just want to thank everyone again who had anything to do with creating this place and making it available to all of us. So um, I, uh, I, I'm going to be speaking uh, today on, uh, uh, on a topic that usually does not get addressed in Buddhist lectures, and that's marriage. Be and, uh, the uh, and, the reason, and the reason it doesn't usually get talked about is because if we look back at history, the Buddha himself, I won't say he wasn't a model husband, but <clears throat> those of you who are familiar with the story of Prince Siddhartha know that uh, his job from the day he was born, his job was to be a prince and that his other job was to provide another prince uh, to rule the kingdom should he die. And so uh, that, was his whole, that was his whole purpose in life, was to be born to, and then to have another, another child. <laughs> so the, the hierarchy of the kingdom could continue. Well, after he fulfilled his mission, and uh, he and his wife had a son, uh, he, he said, well, you know, there's probably more that I could be doing in my life. And so he um, asked to go on a tour of his kingdom. It was a small city state in northern India. And, uh, and so he went on a tour of his kingdom with a, a chaperone. And, uh, and each, uh, just about everywhere they went, they saw some kind of suffering. They saw some kind of suffering. The, um, uh, the, there was sickness, 
there was uh, aging, there was death. And each of these um, scenes upset Prince Siddhartha very much because living a sheltered life as he had been living in the, yeah, is it backwards again? Did it fall? Oh, it did, it fell. Yeah, oh, this, this poor, this poor ear. It just, it just can't, it can't handle. My poor ear, let's try again. Okay, yeah, okay, yeah, that may be. Oh. Yeah, let's, let's do this. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry. Yeah, no, it's quite all right. Yeah, very good. Okay, hey, very good. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks. So, um, and so the, the Prince Siddhartha had lived a very sheltered life in the palace, and he, uh, he had no idea that there was this kind of suffering out among his people. And the shock of it was pretty much more than he could take. And so he thought long and deeply after that about what it would mean to rule such a kingdom where this kind of suffering was happening. And he made the uh, decision, for better or worse, that uh, he would leave his son and wife in the care of his father and his stepmother, and he would go on a spiritual search to find how to resolve the question of suffering. So you might say that the, uh, that the Buddha when he was Prince Siddhartha, he was married and he had a child. And so you could say that he understands the life of a lay person. But after he did his spiritual seeking and after he became uh, spiritually enlightened, he, he stayed alone. He stayed alone. And eventually his wife and his stepmother joined him in the order of monastic renunciates that he then founded, one for men, one for women. And so uh, you could say that the Buddha, it wasn't that he was um, uh, down on marriage particularly, uh, but that he had, he had some questions. So after that, his followers were mainly monastic. And so this is why it's a little bit of a, of a it, it makes me laugh and it makes me smile to think that here I am, a, a Buddhist coming from a mainly monastic background who is herself not a monastic, but is a married person, which as one Catholic monastic said, next best thing to being a monastic is to be married. Um, anyway, um, there's many different shades of humor in that. I think I won't go, I think I won't go into it right now. Although, uh, if you want to read a nice essay on this, there is an essay on how, um, how monogamy uh, is like monasticism in a very positive way, in that our relationships with others, therefore, can be completely clear of any kind of inappropriate um, wanting. So I thought that was kind of an interesting, kind of an interesting viewpoint on that. And um, it's suddenly, um, oh, it was, um, I believe it was Kathleen Norris uh, who wrote Dakota, and, and it, might, it might be in her essay collection. In any case, um, so having, uh, so having the opportunity to talk about marriage doesn't come often uh, in Buddhism. But it's going, to, it's going to happen today because uh, this is um, the, today is the day we're going to celebrate uh, my husband and uh, I's uh, 50th wedding anniversary. So yeah, um, the actual anniversary was Friday. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, the actual anniversary was Friday, and uh, we're going to have a party today. Y'all can stay and uh, have some cake. Uh, but I'm getting to that in a minute. So, uh, so because of the opportunity that is afforded to me by having this event happen today when, you know, when I'm going to be giving a talk, I am going to talk a little bit about marriage. And the name of the talk is Happy Accidents and Intentional Mistakes. So uh, you'll, well, more will be revealed. But let's begin as we normally do with a prayer. Uh, this is the prayer of taking refuge. We'll recite it two times in English to absorb the meaning and one time in Tibetan so we can feel some of the blessing from its original language. In the Buddha, the Dharma, and the assembly, most excellent, 
I take refuge until I reach enlightenment. By the merit of generosity and other good deeds, may I achieve enlightenment for the sake of all beings. In the Buddha, the Dharma, and the assembly most excellent, I take refuge until I reach enlightenment. By the merit of generosity and other good deeds, may I achieve enlightenment for the sake of all beings. Okay, so I'll recite it in Tibetan. If you would like, you can join. Oh, Sanje Chudan Soji Chonaham La Jang Chu Pardu Dani Kyap Suji Daji Jin Soji Besanam Ki Drola Pinchir Sanje I'll say one more short prayer and then we'll begin. Oi Paldin Sawe Lama Rimpo Che Tagi Chi War Pede Ten Shala Kadrin Jembo Gone Che Sun Te Kursun Tugging a Hood Rub Okay, thank you. So, um, Arriving at a milestone like uh, a 50th wedding anniversary causes a, a person to reflect uh, on, uh, on the meaning of relationship and of course specifically on the meaning of marriage. So what can I say? What can I say? What can I say? <laughs> I can say what I usually say when I do, I do marriage ceremonies. I do commitment ceremonies, marriage ceremonies, and I have things that I normally say, you know. Uh, I normally uh, talk about how wonderful it is to celebrate love and how wonderful it is to celebrate the love of two people. And I usually start by talking about how powerful it is to come together as a community to celebrate love and the power that love has in our life. And then talk about how we nurture that. How do we nurture that love? How do we make it uh, continue and last? And, um, and I often will quote from this book, uh, Dharma Paths, uh, P-A-T-H-S, Dharma Paths, by Kempo Kartha Rinpoche. He talks about the six perfect virtues and uh, in, in a chapter about uh, the, the six perfect virtues that are taught in Mahayana Buddhism as being the path to enlightenment. The path to enlightenment begins with the wish to attain enlightenment for the benefit of all beings. That's the bodhisattva motivation. Bodhi means enlightenment or awakening. And uh, sattva is a person who is working toward the mind of awakening. And so the bodhisattva practices these six perfect virtues. And, uh, and so uh, Kempo Kartha Rinpoche explains them very well in his book, The Great Path, I mean, uh, The Dharma Paths. And then there is another explanation by um, John Goncontrol the Great in his book, Great Path of Awakening. These are the two books I, I tend to reference when I do ceremonies. And uh, I then go uh, and give a list of what the six perfect virtues are. I list them for the wedding guests. And I say, it begins with generosity. And it's followed by ethics. Patience, which usually gets a laugh. Somehow, marriage and patience go together hand in hand. Then the other two are diligence, I'm sorry, the other three are diligence, uh, meditation, and wisdom. So generosity, ethics, patience, diligence, meditation, and wisdom. These are the six perfect virtues. And so these are the things that I usually talk about in, when I do these ceremonies for people. 
Uh, that, that's how the six perfect virtues give love its power. It, the power to, uh, to last and the power to endure. So the six perfect virtues feed love and keep it alive. Being generous. What more basic human thing is there than to be giving and to be allowing? There's more than one kind of generosity. There is the generosity of giving what is needed, uh, but there's also the generosity of your time and the generosity of your openness to listen to someone. Even if you don't agree with them, there's a generosity of spirit that comes from being open to hear what others have to say. And then ethics follows directly from generosity because if we are generous, it's very easy to be ethical and to treat people with respect. If you, if you have a generosity of spirit, it's very easy to be ethical and to treat people well and to treat people properly and with dignity and respect. And then once we have been generous and learned how to treat people with respect, then patience really becomes easier. It's not, patience is never going to become a snap. It's not ever going to become super easy because we all are human and we all have preferences. We like things a certain way and all of that. So patience is not easy for us, but if we are generous and ethical, then patience comes naturally. And then if we are generous and ethical and patient, then diligence, that's not so hard to be diligent about maintaining respect and being diligent about maintaining our spiritual growth and development. And then if we're diligent about our spiritual growth and development, then meditation is not gonna be a chore for us. It'll be something we naturally like to do. We'll look at our cushion and say, vacation, uh, you know, from everyday life. It's a vacation from everyday busyness. It's a vacation from everyday worries and concerns. So our practice cushion then becomes a place of refuge for us. And then if we practice all of these, if we are generous and ethical and patient and, uh, see, and diligent and we meditate, then wisdom is the result of all of those. And so with that, I described the six perfect virtues to the wedding guests. So that's what I usually say about weddings, at weddings, to people who are in commitments and marriage ceremonies. Now, everyone talks about the work of marriage, and they're not wrong. <laughs> they're not wrong. Um, I think one of the major uh, bit of, bits of work that has to be done in marriage is the patience part. It's the patience part and the generosity part because expectation happens in every relationship. We come to expect things from other people. Although in this book, there's one quotation where he said, don't expect much, much of people, pray instead. basically pray for patience, you know, don't expect much of people, just pray. The, written by a monastic, I just need to say that. But, but expectation and disappointment really provide the work of any relationship because we have to manage our expectations and be realistic about them and then be generous when they're not met. As long as they don't involve, involve anything life-threatening, like how I drive. Oh. So uh, we have to learn to manage our expectations and our disappointments and manage how we expect things and how we experience disappointment. Because how we experience disappointment, according to Chogyam Trungpa Rinpoche, is going to say a lot about the quality of our life for the rest of our lives and also the quality of our passing away. He says in one of his essays, Chogyam Trungpa says that the way we deal with disappointment is very much our own. You know, when we get disappointed, then what do we do and who do we become when we're disappointed and when we have to express our disappointment and so forth. 
Um, I, I like movies, which will now be old movies for you. Um, and there was, um, there's a funny character in the movie A Fish Called Wanda. He's played by Kevin Klein, And his big line is, disappointed, because that's how he always responded to being disappointed. Um, I've been like that sometimes myself, so I, I can relate. But what we need to do in this situation is to recognize that everybody's human and everybody makes mistakes. And everybody can learn from those, including us. Everything is, if we also understand expectation, disappointment, and we understand the impermanence of everything, can we talk? Impermanence. Um, I remember the first time I uh, confronted impermanence, I was in the sixth grade, and one of my neighbors died, and I was devastated. Nobody in my family had died, you know, and I was, I'm, I was almost a teenager, you know, and, and it's like suddenly somebody dies, and it was a horrific experience. But the other thing that happened when I was in the sixth grade is that I went into a a Catholic mass, because yes, I was raised Catholic. Anybody else? Anyway, yeah, okay, there's a few of us out there. Um, and uh, I had Dominicans, you know, anyway. Um, and uh, I walked into, uh, I, uh, the priest walked into mass, and at the beginning of his uh, sermon, he said, I walked through the door and walked up the aisle and came to the altar. And he said, that moment will never happen again. And that it blew my 11-year-old mind. Impermanence, wow, that's never gonna happen again. It's already over, wow. I mean, really, I still remember it today that it was like mind-blowing for me to discover impermanence for the first time. First through the, the death of someone who was close to me and then through this statement of the truth of impermanence which is how we learn to deal with expectation and disappointment, is to recognize that everything is changing all the time. Impermanence means that expectations will inevitably be disappointed. Impermanence is that things will always be changing and that you can't hold on to them. Because we married as teenagers, I was 19, my husband was uh, 18 when we got married. We were still technically teenagers. I didn't really understand a lot of this stuff. And, uh, and so when the first blush of true love began to fade, I was like, what happened? And I forgot the impermanence thing. I totally forgot the impermanence thing. It was like, it was gone. And I said, well, now what? I had to sit and think about that. What does it mean? What do I do now? And the answer was, you just keep putting one foot in front of the other foot and keep moving forward. Because there's nothing for you to look back and say, oh, I wish I feel like I felt like those first weeks and months of the relationship, right? And so, uh, and so uh, we all know now that that, that, those, uh, that flash does fade a bit and that we need to then work on these perfect virtues as a way of keeping love alive. Generosity of spirit, ethics, patience, and the rest. If we can keep those things going, then we can actually keep what is inside of love, which is the choice to be with someone. And recognizing that being with that person makes us better. Being with that person makes us better. And that person helps us become who we are and uh, contributes so much to uh, our happiness and well-being, but also allows us, there's generosity again, allows us to be who we are. So uh, really it's, um, See, what you end up doing is you end up seeing the other person and what you have with them as being very important. 
And, uh, you know, my husband and I argue many times. Uh, we're both very quick-witted, and we're both very competitive, and we're both very stubborn. And we grew up in conflict-diverse families, so we didn't learn how to do that part. And so sometimes um, we argued about things, and it took us a, a while to see how to deal with conflict and to see it not as a I win, you lose situation. Uh, and the, my friends in 12-step really helped me out with one of their slogans, do you want to be right or do you want to be happy? Do you want to be right or do you want to be happy? And then that, gives me the, that gave me a reality check that I needed because was that thing, how important is it? That's another 12-step slogan. Like, you know, is this, is this the, the hill you want to fight over? You don't. So um, what I learned later from uh, my, my friendly neighborhood therapist was that it's important to continue to nurture love in a relationship because when love goes out of a relationship, all that's left is to argue over power, who has it and who wants it. And I've seen this happen in other relationships that I've been asked to, uh, to uh, talk about and to, and to work with. So, uh, so that, those are some of the things I learned. And um, I don't, as you can see, have a lot to say about it because there's, you know, what can I say? The, you, you, some people say, you know, don't you lose something by being married to the same person for 50 years? And I say, impermanence, baby, impermanence. That is not the same person I married, and that's okay. Because I have married and then chosen to remain with uh, the same person who is actually different over and over and over. Over 50 years, I've been married to completely different people. <laughs> because, you know, because each iteration of ourselves is a it bears some resemblance to the previous iteration, but hopefully it's better, you know. <laughs> kinder, more generous, more patient, more loving. You know, so as long as our iterations of ourselves get more kind, loving, open, and, and allowing, then, 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 you know, we've, we've been married several times to many different people, and it's all worked, so far it's worked out. So, but we also have, there's the one more thing I wanna talk about, and then we can either talk about marriage or relationships in, the, uh, in the, our question, period in our discussion period at the end here, or we can talk about anything you might want to know about Buddhism, because I know that not everybody is interested in talking about marriage. But I do have one more point to make about it before going to the discussion part. And that is that we have to be open to not just to impermanence and understanding that impermanence affects our expectations and disappointments and we have to find ways to manage our disappointments by understanding that the other person has a right to be, <laughs> that the other person has ideas, that the other person is not us, you know? Um, and uh, this is probably the time to talk about the wisdom of Frank for a second. Let me, let me veer sideways into a story I've told many times and so I'm sorry this is a repeat. But for some of you, it will be the first time hearing about the wisdom of Frank. It, Frank is not his real name. For reasons of anonymity, we changed his name. Uh, Frank was a co-worker of my husband. My husband uh, worked for the uh, US Postal Service for almost 30 years. Uh, that and independent trucking, I believe, are the last bastions of the rugged individual. <laughs> the man or woman who carries your mail is a unique person. They, they are willing to deal with incredibly um, draconian supervision in order to be outdoors for six hours a day. It's great. But, and to meet customers that they love forever. Anyway, my husband's coworker, Frank, was mm, a, such a rugged individual. He was one such rugged individual. He really enjoyed several things. Drinking, he really liked to get drunk, sometimes during the workday. And he really had a very high opinion of himself. Uh, he thought that he was really a great person who was, who was worthy of praise by other people. He liked to also liked to swear. 
And sometimes he forgot to bathe. You know, so Frank was truly a unique individual. Well, one day, Frank comes in from the mail route in the afternoon, and he had obviously had alcohol for lunch, and maybe instead of lunch, and he was in a really good mood. And he was saying, you know, I don't know what's wrong with everybody in the world today. What's wrong with people today? You know, they could be more like me if they would just try. And there was something raucously funny about that idea that here is Frank, not exactly the model human beings, wishing that everyone could recognize his greatness and wish that everyone could be more like him. So my husband brought this story home and we talked about it. And later it came up, Frank came up spontaneously. Um, why we named him after my father-in-law, I'm not entirely sure. Anyway, so, um, anyway, but, so, um, uh, we were arguing about something. I mean, something stupid, okay? How do you arrange the dishes in the dishwasher? That kind of stupid, right? That, dumb stuff. And then suddenly, my husband looks up at me and he says, well, you know, you could be more like me if you just try. <laughs> And after that, after that, the wisdom of Frank became a guiding light. <laughs> the wisdom of Frank became a guiding light to us in our relationship. Because whenever we discovered that we were trying to push each other back and forth over power or over rightness, we would stop the argument, look at each other and say, but you could be more like me if you just try. And, and so this, I'm just giving you the wisdom of Frank today, hopeful and hopeful that it will help you as it has helped me. Uh, because sharing strength and hope is what we do in rooms like this. So anyway, um, besides sharing the wisdom of Frank, I do want to talk about the title of my talk today, which I have not discussed yet, which is about happy accidents and intentional mistakes. We all know that accidents are usually not greeted with goodness and not happiness. And that mistakes are usually something we feel horribly guilty about for uh, days, weeks, months, and probably even years. Um, but you can learn something by being open to happy accidents. Um, and, um, and to mistakes being open to mistakes and not judging them sometimes is actually a learning tool and very, it can be very good for us. I learned about happy accidents and dealing with happy accidents when I visited a, a, a Buddhist uh, family in Northern Ohio and uh, the mother was getting ready to take her children on a, on a day outing. And um, uh, the mother said, we're going to the zoo. We're going to the zoo. We're going to the zoo. But what if we get to the zoo and the zoo is closed? <gasps> We're going to the park. We're going to the park. And when we get to the park, if the park is busy, <gasps> we're going to visit grandma. Or we're going to visit, you know. So, so what she did was she worked her way through the various mishaps that could occur to them during the day as they were trying to have fun. And coming up with the idea that even accidents can be happy. Like if the zoo's closed, well, let's go to the park, and so on. And so um, I, off I offer you that, mo that wonderful mother's wisdom as another way to be open to happy accidents because sometimes it's okay. Not getting what you want can actually be okay. And it can actually be even better if you are open to it and not clinging. That's the Buddhist principle behind all of the five, I mean, all of the six perfect virtues is not clinging and not being fixated on having things your way. And uh, now, intentional mistakes. Um, I love cake, there's no secret. I'm, I'm really, I, it's one of my struggles in life is I'm addicted to cake. I love cake. More than pie, really. 
although pie is really good. <sighs> pie is really good. I mean, it's fruit, right? You know, so that you can say, you know, you can say you're eating something healthy because there's fruit. I'm just saying. Okay. So I love cake. And my husband went through a period of time where he was learning how to bake, which is great. And so there's a Betty Crocker cookbook that was issued in the 1960s. And, um, and we, had, we were given this actually 1970s edition of the Betty Crocker cookbook when we got married in 1973. So in that cookbook, there was a delicious cake. It was called chocolate whipped cream cake. Who wouldn't want that? It's got chocolate, it's got cake, it's got everything. And you had to make it from scratch. Therefore, you had to put the flour and the sun on one side and then there was no, there was no um, oil in this cake. It was all whipped cream that you whipped up from the bottle of whipping cream and you made this whipped cream and then you were supposed to heat up the chocolate and the chocolate then was supposed to go into the cake into the whipped cream and then turn it into this beautiful brown masterpiece. And so we got, to the, we got to the cake and we did everything the best we could, but we made a mistake. We added the chocolate in the wrong way at the wrong time. And instead of this uniformly beautiful chocolate brown, we got flakes, a white cake with brown flakes throughout it. And at first, it's great. It's very disappointing. Didn't come out the way you wanted it, right? But it was so good. It was really delicious. And all those little flakes of bittersweet chocolate, oh my gosh, they were incredible. So we looked at each other and we said, we're making this mistake every time now. We will intentionally make this mistake every single time because it's good. So again, happy accidents and intentional mistakes. Because we have to be open to things changing and things developing and not be scared of where they're taking us and not be scared of, where, of what's next in this impermanent world where things are changing. And to, and to really find happiness even in accidents and even in mistakes. So um, I think we choose to make some, we choose to make that chocolate mistake over and over again. And, uh, and uh, if you stay after the talk, you can have a piece of that cake because we made one last night. And it turned out just as wrong as it turned out the very first time. And we hope it turned out well enough, you know, so there'll be pieces of cake downstairs uh, at the end. Okay, so enough talk, 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 let's talk together. Let's have a discussion. Do you have anything you'd like to ask about or anything that you'd like, anything about Buddhism that you want to ask about? It doesn't have to be on the topic. Uh, the question microphone is open. And if, uh, if you have anything that you're like scratching your head about, here's a question. Yes, sir. What is your question? Why is that one Buddha so big? Okay, yeah. Uh, great question, thank you very much. Uh, the questioner is asking, what's, what's behind me? And, what is, and why is that Buddha so big? Number one, number one it is, uh, they call it a shrine. Sometimes it's called an altar, but I like shrine better because shrine is like where you put precious things. A shrine is where you put things that are precious. And for Buddhists, the Buddha is very precious because he gave us the example of how to be a good human being. So he is, that's why he's so big, because he is the most important thing on the shrine. It's the most important thing we honor because he represents, he represents love and compassion and wisdom, the most perfect wisdom, the most perfect compassion, the most perfect love. So because he is the center of what we want to become, he's in the middle. And he's really, he's bigger than the others for that reason. They're all representations of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas who worked for the benefit of all beings and achieved goodness. You have one more question, because then we'll let other people ask. Yes, what's your other question? 
there are uh, there are two paintings behind us, and one, it's uh, the, the, there's a larger one and a smaller one. The smaller one is the uh, is the picture of Guru Rinpoche. Guru means teacher, and Rinpoche means precious. So the precious teacher who helped bring Buddhism to the land of Tibet. That's the smaller one. The bigger one is the Karmapa. And what Karmapa means is a person who undertakes the activities of a Buddha. And there have been 17 Karmapas so far, and 16 of them are represented in that painting. So they're, they're sort of like our spiritual leaders from the past. Some of them lived very long ago. The lineage has been around 900 years. 900 years is a very long time. Hmm, now, now you have me wondering. Are there trees in California that are 900 years old? I wonder. That's where our big trees are. I wonder. It's, it's a lot of trees. Thank you for your questions. Now, we're going to give someone else a turn. OK, I'll come back to you if, if we run out of questions. Yes. So I had to write them down. No, yeah, that's quite all right. Uh, first is a uh, announcement. If you Google uh, uh, secrets uh, of the dead, uh, there's a, a very good documentary on uh, called Bones of the Buddha. Oh my goodness! So uh, cool. Uh, secrets, dead Buddha. Okay. Uh, I think we'll get you there. Okay. Netflix. That's cool. Uh, yeah, it's not totally accurate, uh, oh, thank but you. It, it's very, very interesting. Cool. Uh, second, uh, your Frank story about Frank uh, makes me remember, uh, this is a joke. I, I don't want to be disrespectful, but uh, if you recognize that I'm enlightened, then you are enlightened also. There you go. Uh, and then last thing is, uh, given that we should accept and be compassionate uh, and uh, be kind, then uh, what should we do uh, when we're faced uh, uh, by somebody who's trying to kill us? Mm -hmm. Should I? be compassionate for them and uh, mm -hmm. uh, end up dead? Should I fight? Should I run? Mm -hmm. No, I understand. Thank you. Yeah, Kempo Kartha Rinpoche was actually asked this question once, uh, here in Columbus, as a matter of fact. And his answer was, I feel um, very, very um, considered and, and somewhat wise. He said, um, he said the, that if someone is trying to hurt you, he said, um, you should run as fast as possible in the other direction. And he said, uh, he said, you should try your best to escape being harmed. And then he said, if you have to, if you have no choice but to fight back, well, then you have to fight back and stop the person from hurting you. And he said, but you have to have compassion for them. And you have to not hate them for wanting to hurt you. That's probably going to be the hardest. Because uh, he said that is actually causing harm to you. Your hatred of the person who's trying to harm you and your fear and hatred of that person is actually harming you. Because holding that kind of mind is really damaging. So the answer is both. We both can run, we both can fight, and then, but we have to accept the karmic consequence. He also said that. If you harm that other person, that's, on, that's your karma. You've harmed someone and you've accumulated the negative karma of harming someone. Some people are willing to accept that and other people are not, and it depends on the individual. Both are correct. You know, because he said there's only one good thing about bad karma. He said, you could purify bad karma. So that, you know, so in any case, so, so, he, so it's both that you can run and you can fight, but you have to accept the consequence of that. 
And at the same time, you have to try to have compassion for the person who's trying to harm you. Usually that's not possible. So what you can do instead, this is me, that's the end of his answer and the beginning of mine, which is um, it's really good to pray for people who want to harm you. It's good to pray for them and to pray that their minds are open. In fact, um, Kemper Rinpoche was asked, well, how do you pray for a harmful person? And he said, uh, he spoke spontaneously a prayer, and I won't remember it exactly, but it's something like, through the, through the grace and power of the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, may this person uh, come to see their Buddha nature, begin the path, and become enlightened. So hopefully those things help. Thank you very much. Oh, yeah, no, thanks for asking. You yeah, know, these are good questions. Uh, I wanted to just do a comment, uh, oh, sure. some follow-up yeah, uh, yeah. based on the question because, you know, um, you know, I've been doing martial arts for 42 years now and, uh -huh. and I taught for a long time. And when I first became a Buddhist, I, I was really struggling with the difference between nonviolence and pacifism. You might and, need to speak uh, up. So uh, you know, one of the things I was struggling yeah, with is you. the difference between nonviolence and pacifism. Right. And... Um, Bharata Rinpoche, um, you know, he, he said that uh, one aspect of generosity is the providing of protection. And, um, and so if you happen to be trained, mm -hmm. um, you know, you can, if you see something, someone being harmed, mm -hmm. uh, you can provide the protection. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so I, and, and, and that was something that, say with me, of course, the mindset Mm -hmm. of, uh, that you can develop in, like, let's say, martial arts. There, there is mm -hmm. a toxic element that can happen. They have to be very careful I'm about. sorry. I, there's, I, a, there's a toxic element that, you, that can develop if you're not careful in, in that whole protection. So that, um, I do believe that people can be physically peaceful and very violent in their behavior, uh, in, their oh. in their emotionally. I see. Um, but the... Uh, but just that, that was the comment that he had shared that helped me was the, um, about the practice of generosity and, and providing protection. Oh, thank you. Thanks. Yeah, no, thanks very much. I appreciate, I appreciate you sharing that. Yeah, there are three kinds of um, generosity. There's material generosity, the providing of what they call fearlessness, which is protecting those who are in harm's way. And then finally, there's the third kind of generosity, which is Dharma generosity, giving the Dharma. So uh, may we all be able to practice these in our life. So thanks very much for sharing what you learned about that. I appreciate it. Yes. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> I would like to say thank you. Um, getting ready to come up on my five-year anniversary, and uh, thank you for doing the ceremony. Are you sure you did those six things? Because I don't remember them <laughs> being said on that day, so um, thank you for the reminders. Oh, you're wonderful. Yeah, no, thank you. Yeah, uh, you're, you're correct. Uh, they, I did do different things for different couples, but uh, usually I'll, I will at least list them, but maybe I didn't in your case. I don't know. <laughs> Thank you. But uh, is it going okay? Okay, it's going okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, and any other question? Oh, yes, hi. Yeah, we got time for one or two more. Morning. Yeah. Uh, just a brief um, story on marriage that I... Uh, Several years ago, I was running into some guy in a group, and he was moaning about the state of his marriage mm -hmm. and um, complaining about this particular impasse that he and his wife were at. Uh -huh. And I said, well, what would happen if you just did what your wife wanted you to do in that situation? And he said, well, then I would not win. Oh, and then it, I would not win. Okay, and it, yeah. and it, it, I, I had never thought that there were actually two different things going on, the subject matter and the power thing that oh, you yeah, brought up. So um, it's wow. up for all of us, I think. Yeah, th thanks for sharing that. Because, it, I, I mean, it really, it really is interesting to me, isn't it? 
I, it was like a, a light bulb went off for me when, the, when my therapist friend told me that. You know, when love goes out of a relationship, all that's left is to argue over who has the power. And then, it, and then uh, that's really helped me in so many ways to see the dynamic happening in several different relationships in my life. And it's like, oh, okay, I get that part. Because, uh, you know, and putting more love into a relationship putting more love, more giving, I mean, you know, more goodness into a relationship, that can really be um, very helpful. So thank you for sharing that story. It's like, it's, a, it's an example of finding it in the wild. You know, these pr principles that we learn about, like seeing them in the wild is kind of nice. Yes. Uh -huh. Again, a little bit of a comment. Yeah. Um, I have one brain style. My husband is 180 opposite to each other. Okay. And so the the idea, uh, another saying, great saying, is opposites attract and then drive each other crazy. Oh, yes. So one of the things I think, too, along with that love, along with that generosity, is also an understanding. As yeah. you were saying before, it's okay to be different. Yeah. It's okay to want different things. Right. And that actually that's a source of en enrichment for us. Absolutely. Oh, thank you so much. I, I really appreciate you sharing that from your, uh, you know, your own experience. You know what, the other thing that seems to help me a lot is a great sense of humor. <laughs> um, great sense of humor will help a lot uh, because now that my husband and I are, because you know, I mentioned I was 19, he was 18 when we got married. And now we're like, what, I'm 69 and he's 68, right? So, uh, so we're forgetful now. And we can't, we can't hear very well. <laughs> what? My family doctor said, I will give you advice that will save your marriage. And I'm like, yes, I'm listening. And she said, when you're speaking to each other, she said, I want you to be in the exact same room with each other and be looking at each other. <laughs> I want you to promise me that when you are speaking to each other, you will take the time to go into the same room and look at each other. And, and, and you know, it's really helped a lot. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Hall. Um, and then the other thing is that because we're getting older, we are not hearing things and we are, we are forgetting like important things. And so, um, like, you know, like, I need the car. Oops, you didn't tell me. And it's like, you're right, I didn't, whoops. You know, and so we forget stuff and it causes problems. And so we made a deal. And the deal is, if I forget something that's really important, or he forgets something that's really important, we are to look at each other and say, the adventure continues. Because there's, I mean, me getting mad at him for not remembering, he getting mad at me for not remembering. I mean, it's like useless. It's like worse than useless. So it's like we have to find a way to give that kind of generosity, to be, have this generosity of spirit so you're open to the fact that, that people are different and, and it's okay to be different. So thank you for sharing that. Well, because of time, we'll have to stop here. Um, I'm sorry that we ran out of time, but I really liked all of your questions, so thank you for asking them. And, um, and so um, I guess what we can do now is do a very Buddhist thing and dedicate our merit. There's a, there's a prayer we say at the end every week, and this is the prayer of dedicating the goodness that we've put together here by being here, and the goodness we've created by being here together today and dedicating it to all beings developing these skills and nurturing their Buddha nature and becoming Buddhas themselves. We'll recite these through once in English and then I'll go back and recite them in Tibetan, okay? We'll start with the words, by this merit. By this merit may all attain omniscience. May it defeat the enemy wrongdoing from the stormy waves of birth, old age, sickness and death. From the ocean of samsara, may I free all beings. The courageous Manjushri, who knows everything as it is. Samantabhadra, who also knows in the same way. And all the bodhisattvas that I may follow in their path, I completely dedicate all this virtue. 
So I'll recite it in Tibetan. You can join if you would like. Oh, so Tom ne ne petra nam pam che ne ke ga na chi pa lap tru pa yi si pe so le tro wa tro wa sho jam pa pa ho ji tar ken pa dang Kun tu sam po de yan te jin te de da kun ki che su ta lo ching ge wa di ta tam che rap tu mo. And now I'll ring the bell and we'll sit quietly for just a moment and mentally dedicate all the goodness. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And uh, we'll see you again next week, unless, of course, you'd like to go down and get cake. Now, it, the cake has not been cut yet, so we better get on that. So give us about five minutes, okay? Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, uh, thank you, uh, Don. Appreciate it. We got it, we got it worked out. <laughs>